Well, at this time, um, we're going to have someone come up and speak. He was born and raised in Papua New Guinea, and he loves Disney and can probably school any of you at a lyrical singing competition. <laughs> this is Matt Bob. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you for that introduction. I do love Disney, and I love the classics, for the most part, um, and singing the songs. So anytime you want to sing Disney, talk to me. Um, cool. I, this is incredible. Like, I'm just looking out, and pretty much every seat is filled in here, and that's awesome. We've had to add a couple extra rows. And I just want to say, if you're new here, Welcome, please, please hang out with us. Afterwards, the, like, <laughs> the, I mean, we, yeah, after this, we're gonna have some time to hang out and then we go out to lunch after. So please, please hang out. We want you to feel welcome, like this is a place that you belong. Um, yeah, I'm just gonna pretty much dive in here. So uh, I know we prayed a couple times, but let me just pray one more time for our time here. God, I just thank you that the, the words of those songs we sang are true, and Lord, we just pray that you would be here in our midst, that you would speak powerfully today, and it's in Jesus' name that we pray, amen. All right, so Allison told you at the very beginning, it was kind of crazy, so I don't know if you caught it, but we are a group of students who love people, love Jesus, and want to give everybody an opportunity to know him, Okay. And we're actually going to be starting a series in these weekly meetings called The Letters in Red. Because in a lot of Bibles, the words that Jesus says are in red font. And so we're pretty focused on this guy. And uh, you may be wondering, and I kind of thought, maybe a good place to start is, is this guy even worth listening to? Like, is, is he worth centering our life around? And I think the reality is that we center our lives around something. It's just human nature. Maybe it's a significant other or like family or money, a career path, school, whatever it is. We center our lives around something. And in my life, I found that that list of things always ends up coming short. And so this question is, is, is Jesus worth centering our lives around? And to answer that, I think we need to look at one who he's been known to be, and two, what he's done. So, like I said, we're going to dive in. I'm going to turn to the book of Colossians. This, this is a book um, written by the Apostle Paul, and the whole Bible talks about this Jesus. Um, but this is a, a chunk that really sums it up well, because Paul's writing to people who have put their faith in Jesus, but then have started to kind of believe some weird things about him. And so Paul kind of just straight up says, uh-uh, this is who Jesus is. So turn with me if you've got it, or there's going to be the verses on the screen. Colossians 1, starting in verse 15. It says, he is the image of the invisible God. Now, th this was originally written in Greek. And th that word image is the Greek word icon. And basically, uh, it's where we get our word our English word icon from. It, it's this idea of a portrait, okay? So I want to show you a picture. Okay. Isn't he cute? <laughs> um, so this is, by the way, guys, if you had shown me a picture of a baby like three months ago, I'd have been like, oh, great. But something changes when you become an uncle. I can't explain it. Um, <laughs> so this is my uh, nephew, Andrew. And uh, he's two and a half months old. And he is not here right now. He lives in Dallas. But as I show you this, I can tell you that this is my nephew. This is Andrew. And you now know what he looks like. And if he were here, you would recognize him. Because you have seen his icon, his portrait. Okay? When Paul is saying that Jesus is the icon of of the invisible God. It's not just saying that he's like some, uh, y you know, he represents him well. He's saying that Jesus is the exact representation of an invisible God. Okay? Um, and basically, this is pretty heavy. Like, this is a lot. And you might be asking, wait, is, 
is this even what Jesus said? Because this is this guy, Paul, writing. And I think that's a great question to ask. And so let's look at what Jesus says about himself. So in, Paul, in John 14... Um, this guy named Philip, who's been following Jesus around for a while, um, is, he's been hearing all this stuff. Jesus is talking about God the Father. But he hasn't really gotten it. Okay? So one day, Philip says, Lord, just, just show us the Father, and that will be enough. Okay? Have you ever had one of those times where like, one of your good friends asks you something, and you're like, seriously, do you even know me? Like, I don't know. For me, it's like cilantro. I hate cilantro, okay? And most people who are laughing know that. And so if, if a good friend of mine were to say, like, Matt, do you want some cilantro, a.k.a. puke, on your taco? I would be like, uh, do you know me? And, and I love this because G- Philip says this, Lord, just show us the Father, and that will be enough. And Jesus' response is, is basically that. Jesus answers, Don't you know me, Philip, even after I have been among you such a long time? Anyone who has seen the Father, sorry, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. In other words, I'm it. You want to see God. You want to see the Father. You look at me. Um, I I heard another talk on Colossians 1 by a uh, regional director of crew named Bob Foose, and he puts it this way. He says, when we look into the face of Jesus, we're looking at the face of the God of the universe. Is that up? Could you put the quote up? Yep, awesome. Um, When we look into the face of Jesus, we're looking at the face of the God of the universe. The remarkable truth is not that Jesus is God-like, but that God is Christ-like. All true perspectives of God must be seen through the person of Jesus of Nazareth. That's pretty incredible. Again, is he, is he worth following? Is he worth centering our lives around? And then Paul goes on to say in the next verse, or in the same verse, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. A lot of people get hung up on this, this word Firstborn. And what Paul is not saying here is that Jesus was created first. He's not talking about Jesus being a created being at all. He's saying what, something that they would have understood very well back then. Because back in that day, the firstborn, being the firstborn was a big deal. You got certain privileges, um, more than like watching a PG-13 movie first in your family. At least that's what, how it was in mine. Um, <laughs> but... Uh, it was, you had certain rights over the household, over your parents' property, um, and certain rights over your younger siblings. And so when Paul says this, he's basically saying this is the status, this is, this is who Jesus is over creation. He is supreme. He is above all. He has priority and rights over everything. And Paul goes on to say why that is. In verse 16, he says, For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. See, Paul's saying Jesus is supreme because he was before everything and he created everything. And in him, it all is held together and it was for him that it was created. And again, we can look back at what Jesus said about himself. If you look at John chapter 8, this is, Jesus is talking to a bunch of Jewish leaders in the day. And they kind of aren't really a big fan of this guy. They don't like that he's got so many followers. And so they're kind of listening really closely to what he has to say. And some of the things he says shocks them. And, and one of those things is as he's talking, in verse 56, he says, Your father Abraham, who was, was the guy that God chose to basically birth the Jewish race, um, 
your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. In other words, Jesus is saying, Abraham, even Abraham's focus was on me. And this is kind of crazy because Abraham lived 2,000 years before Jesus did. And so the Jews hear this and they're like, what? What is he saying? And so their response is kind of mockingly, man, you are not yet 50 years old, the Jews said to him, and, and you've seen Abraham? And Jesus' response in this, he says, I tell you the truth, before Abraham was born, I am. And you can see the gravity of this statement in what the Jews did next. It says, they picked up stones to stone him. Okay, why did they do that? Because they understood very well what Jesus was saying. He didn't just accidentally like mess up his verb tenses here. But with this statement, before Abraham was born, I am, he's saying, I have always been, I will always be, I am eternal. And also, this exact wordage, I am, the Jews would have understood exactly as what God called himself back at the burning bush with Moses. God basically commissions Moses and says, go, I want you to set my people free from Egypt. And Moses is like, who am I going to tell sent me? And God says in Exodus 3.14, I am who I am. This is what you are to tell the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. So with this, declaration that Jesus says, he's saying, I am that God that was way back then, the eternal God who created everything, who everything's created for. That's me. And that's why Paul declares this in Colossians. And he goes on in verse 19 to say, for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. The very being of God dwelling in human form in this person of Jesus. And so when deciding if he's worth centering our life around, we need to look at, the, look at what he says. There's so many people who, I'd say most people in the world have said, Jesus is a great teacher. He's a great spiritual leader. But they discount what he says about himself. The reality is, Everything he said was centered around what he believed himself to be, which was God. And so we need to take that into account when, when asking, is he worth following? Who has he been known to be? And the second question is then, what has he done? Going on uh, after verse 19, after Paul says, God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. He says, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. So what has Jesus done? Well, he's died. He, he shed his blood on the cross. Why is that important? Paul says that because of this act that Jesus did, people are able to be reconciled to God. I looked up the, the definition of reconciled. And, and it means to reestablish a close relationship between. So somehow what Jesus did on the cross reestablishes a close connection between people and God. Now, what, what was the state before, if that's the case? Paul says in, in the next verse, verse 21, once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. That's some pretty serious language. I mean, it's no wonder it says that, you know, in, in verse 20, that he had to make peace through his blood. And see, the Bible teaches basically that, like we said, God created us for him. He created us for a relationship and in that, he wanted to pour out his whole goodness and love to us. That, he's like, man, I, I, I love these things so much that I just want to pour out myself into them. And, and 
as a result, have them then reflect that goodness to those around them. But the problem is, man, I've mistrusted God. I basically said, you know, God, I don't know if you really have what's best in mind for me. I, I think I might know better, actually. And, you know, I, I don't really want to be about you as much as I want to kind of be about me and reflect myself. And as a result, this, this relationship that he's created us for has been broken. And in our minds, we've gone against everything that he planned and wanted us for. And we've become enemies in our minds because of him. And that's where the root of this evil behavior comes. Because no longer am I wanting to reflect his goodness. I'm wanting to reflect me over everybody else. And this mistrust and this rebellion is what the Bible calls sin. And God is a holy and perfect God. Which means he's got to punish What's wrong? Otherwise, he wouldn't be worth any respect, right? He's got to punish what, what's wrong. And we deserve a punishment that reflects the gravity of wronging a holy God. And that is what the Bible says is, is death. It's a spiritual separation where we are completely cut off from that goodness, from that love. But, it's one of the best words in the Bible. But, in verse 22, now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. In other words, God looks at this and he says, I can't stop loving you. You've, you've turned against me. You've gone your own way. You've become enemies. But I love you so much. And since there's nothing that you can do to repair that relationship, I'm going to have to do what it takes. I'm going to go on a rescue mission. And so he comes and he invades our earth in the form of a man. And, and as he's on this earth, he does everything that you would expect God to do. He heals broken bodies. He preaches goodness and love. He heals broken relationships. And then he dies. And in dying, he pays that penalty that we deserve so that now there is an opportunity for my record to be clean. That's why he says he did it. So that we can be seen as holy in his sight, without blemish, free from accusation. And verse 23 says, all this is applicable to you if you continue in your faith, established and firm, not moved from the hope held out in the gospel. Just like what broke that relationship was mistrust, was going against what God said. What repairs it is trust, is faith in, in Him, in this person of Jesus Christ. That He is who He says He is. That he did what he did. And it's a continuous faith. It goes on. It's not just something that, oh, okay, I believe it. Great, done. It's a continuous relationship with a God where you experience that love and goodness that he created you for. Okay? The amazing thing is that after Christ died, he rose again. Basically, proving I, that what I said is true. This is who I am. And kind of solidifying, this is what I've done. Death is defeated. There is now a way. Okay? So, I ask, is that someone worth centering your life around? Amen. <laughs> someone who created you for Him to love you. Who did everything it takes so that you could have that, so that you could experience that. And that basically is what we here in crew are about. We're a group that loves people because Jesus loves people. We're a group that loves Jesus because of what he has done, who he is. 
And we're a group that wants to make Jesus known, that wants other people to get to know Him because, man, He is awesome. And He's done incredible things for every person here. So, maybe you're here and, and you, you're just checking this out. I just encourage you to look into the person of Jesus and ask that question. Is He worth it? Is He worth centering my life around? And for those of you who have maybe put your faith in Jesus, as you're going into this new year, just ask, am I centering my life around anything else right now? And make that commitment to say, you know what, I want to be about you, Jesus. Okay, let me pray for us. God, I thank you that you are good and that you are filled with love for us. And I thank you that you have gone on the ultimate rescue mission for us and that we can know you. Lord, I pray that we would live out uh, exactly how you have created us to live. And God, let us just reflect your goodness to all those around us because you love them. God, go with us this week. And I just pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Matt. Um, okay, so now we're going to whip out our phones and text to vote. Um, let's see. Which MC did you like the best? Text the word MC, that's E M C E E, to 85005. And are we going to do like numbers? Yeah, text one for Matt. No? No, we're not. What are we doing? Oh, they'll tell you. After you text, so. And while you're doing that, uh, we have our website, which is calpolycrew.com. Be sure to check that out and look on there for updates. So don't forget grounds tonight, frisbee tomorrow, kickball on Saturday, and prayer and share on Tuesday. And if you guys want to, we're going to go out to lunch afterwards. Do we know where yet? We'll, we'll decide. So we would love to have you join us and hang out. So thank you. In and out.